Hello, I'm Matt Cedarberg, co-founder of T-Spines, Inc., and thanks for joining us for today's webinar with our special guest, Bathsheba Grossman, owner of Bathsheba Sculpture, on how to use T-Spines to create products and sculptures. We're very pleased to have Bathsheba here as we're big fans of her work, and we're also happy that all of you can join us as well. There are over 550 people from around the world registered to attend today. Consequently, you will all remain muted throughout the webinar so that the sound remains clear. However, we welcome your participation. Please ask questions and make comments during the webinar by typing the question in on the box inside the screen. Our T-Spines team will be typing back answers throughout the webinar. Also at the end, we'll give Bathsheba a chance to audibly answer questions directed at her. Now, to give Bathsheba a more proper introduction, Bathsheba Grossman's designs have appeared in the New York Times, the London Times, Der Spiegel, as well as Discover, Make, and Wired magazines. One of her lamps was in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential Designs of 2007. A longtime Reno user, Bathsheba added t to her toolset in 2009 to more easily create freeform designs. In so doing, she joined a growing number of designers from around the world who use T-spines to create smooth organic designs, edit them quickly, and export them for manufacturing. T-spines today is used mainly in five industries, jewelry, consumer products, vehicles and marine, toys, and architectural forms. So the format for this webinar will be slightly different from web webinars we've had in the past. Rather than spending more time talking about how T-spines for anyone can be used for freeform design, we're going to move right into the good stuff by passing the mic over to Bathsheba. She'll, give an, she'll start by giving an intro to her work. Then she will actually do some live modeling inside T-Spines for Ido to show how she has created some of her organic designs with T-Spines. At the end of the webinar, we'll, as a thank you for sticking around, we'll give you a chance to enter a drawing for a free Bathsheba mini sculpture, and then we'll have time to answer your questions. So without further ado, let me uh, turn the time over to Bathsheba. Hi, this is Beth Shiba. Uh, let's see, okay, are you seeing my screen? Uh, not quite yet. Should be coming up shortly. There we go. Yes. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Shiba. As Matt has kindly said, I make sculpture. I do it by designing on the computer and instantiating by means of 3D printing. My work is mostly, mostly mathematical. A lot of it looks like this, but I'll show you a bunch and you can get an idea of what it looks like. This is my exciting website. Now, before uh, 3D printing was invented, I looked like this a lot of the time. I was trained as a traditional sculptor. Now that we have CAD CAM, I look like this more of the time. I still have a studio, but I spend most of my time designing on the computer. What does my work like look like? Well, it looks like this. This was made by direct metal printing. This object is about, what, three to four inches in diameter. As you see, it's very symmetrical. That turns out to be a nice, easy way to work with CAD CAM. Luckily, it was the way I was already working. This is another piece by me. This one's a little bit bigger, five inches or so. It has these nice little glass spheres embedded in it. This was incredibly hard to make. So I only ever made one of them, but I love it. I do also do some work still as a traditional sculptor. This is, uh, this is my I'm a real sculptor slides. This is a design for a piece which was fabricated at a foundry. As you see, this was about uh, three feet tall. We made it by printing the modules in, as Z-Corp parts and then casting those and then assembling the whole thing to make this. So there's another example. And you can see that I approach the uh, symmetry and mathematics of the stuff that I do in this very free-form flowing way, clothing the abstractions in these beautiful curved lines. So you can, you can see sort of T-splines coming into my work. It's, it's going to be a useful tool. I also designed some lamps for this company called MGX. If you owned this lamp, your bedroom would be perfectly clean. Now this is, again, more of how I worked before 3D printing. And you can see here, we've got these lovely flowing lines, at least I flatter myself to say that they're lovely. And these are all bronzes that are hand cast and some, some machined pieces as well, all made completely by hand. It was really hard to work this way and I couldn't make any money. This is a close up of one of them. This, is, this was hand carved in Bondo and then cast in bronze. This was carved in wax and then assembled out of modules and it's cast in silver. It's about three inches in diameter, so that's a good deal of silver. And you can see it's been set with rubies. I liked working this way, but I couldn't make any money because it was just too hard to make anything like this. So in the late 90s, 3D printing began to get popular. 
and suddenly I was able to make a lot of different things. I taught myself CAD, and here are a whole sampler of 3D printed parts. The way that I settled on to work first was by printing Z-Core parts. Z-Core parts are made out of cornstarch, and you can actually lost cat wax cast them straight into bronze using traditional foundry methods. So for a while I did that, and it made parts like this and like that, and this was an extremely annoying and difficult way to work, and again, I couldn't make any money. It was all just too hard. Now, this, uh, this part dates from the moment when I actually bought my own 3D printer. I bought a Solidscape, which is a high-resolution wax printer. This slide is very misleading. This object is actually less than an inch long. I uh, started a jewelry line at that time, and I made a lot of jewelry, which, as you see, shares these same attributes of being mathematical and symmetrical, yet covered in these nice, rounded, free-form, organic shapes, except for this piece, which everyone hated. So I did that for a while, but again, I couldn't really make any money. This was a totally wacky project. I, I printed uh, some parts as stereolithography and took them to a pewter foundry and had them make a bunch of parts, and it assembled into these. Again, only one or two of these were ever made. This is about six inches of diameter. It was great, but there was no way I could sell it. It was all just too labor-intensive. So here we see the first slide of the technology that really made a sculptor of me, direct metal printing. This is a technology in which you actually 3D print metal. You go straight from the CAD model to the steel. This object is about an inch and a half in diameter. And the company that does this is X1 Pro Metal Department. If you want to try it, they are totally available. Now everyone wants to know how 3D metal printing works, so I'm just going to touch on that briefly. It starts with stainless steel powder, very fine powder like cornstarch. This powder is built up into layers forming the object. The powder is mixed with a laser-activated binder. And in a standard powder printing process, objects like this are made. Then they are put into an oven, and the binder is driven off by heat. So we now have an object which is about 60% steel and 40% air. Next thing that happens is the air is replaced by liquid bronze, which is wicked in and fills the porosity. This results in a completely dense metal part. If you cut it, you can see that there's no porosity at all. It's not very pretty, so the next phase is to perform a certain amount of studio finishing, which I do in my very tiny metal shop. It's not very clean either. The main thing that happens here is you can see there is a tumbler, which is like a rock tumbler or a jewelry tumbler. And after I treat with chemicals to change the color and then I tumble, the parts look like this. This is, again, an object about four inches in diameter. You can see that the, the freedom of geometry with metal printing is very great. You can print all kinds of undercuts. You can print big, big interior spaces. You really don't have to worry about what the geometry is going to do. So long as the part is thick enough to actually exist physically, it's going to be fine. This is, again, a piece with lots of heavy undercutting. You don't even have to worry about that anymore with metal printing. It's lovely. This also shows the high precision of it. These, uh, these metal spheres, obviously, were not printed in place. They're just ball bearings. The piece has little detents printed into it, and the ball bearings pop into place, and the, uh, the metal part holds them, which is very nice. If it was a millimeter off, it wouldn't work, but it does work. Another nice thing about 3D printing in metal is that the parts are extremely robust. They're very strong. I really like that in art. There. And again, given that you have extremely strong metal, you can do things like this with it. Those of you familiar with a little mathematics will recognize this as a Klein bottle. However, this Klein bottle opens beers. It is, in fact, the Klein bottle opener. This is something you can do when the material is strong. Also, a nice thing about this part is that I actually had it finished at X1 instead of putting it through the tumbler and uh, doing the studio time myself. And it's really wonderful that they're bringing that finishing in-house. So now I can just order finished metal parts. And now you can order finished metal parts. It's a great way to work. Now, let me talk a little bit about the unpleasant part of this whole process, which is the design side. My workflow is really more like a work stop. My design process is extremely slow and laborious. Typically, it starts with an outline of an object. In the case of this object, I have simply made a little knot of curves in Rhino. This is a screenshot from Rhinoceros. And once I have my curves basically laying out what my piece is going to look like, I start lofting some surfaces and sketching in what this is going to look like trying some different types of surfaces, trying to make solids, beginning to build the actual piece. 
starting to rough in how the, the volumes are going to be treated, how the actual piece is going to look. Here I've developed it out into this sort of organiform object, but I really wasn't very happy with this, so I took it back to the drawing board and started working back into the solids in a different way. And this is all very all being, being done by hand, no T-splines here, and laborious, labor-intensive, takes forever. This is how this finally came out. And you can see that it's all nicely filleted and closed up. <sighs> Go away. Sorry about that. My secretary's trying to get on. But she can't. So that was, uh, that was a lightning journey through something that actually took four months of real-time modeling as I tried to figure out what the piece looks like. And this is how it came out printed in metal. That year, I think I designed two pieces, which is a pretty good rate for me. I'm an extremely slow designer. It takes a lot of time to design something when you don't know in advance what it's going to look like. At least it does for me. It would be a lot easier if I was working to a sketch or I had a customer or there was some reason to think I knew where I was going. So that's a brief overview of how I work and what that all looks like. And now I want to get a little bit into three specific pieces which use T-splines in three different ways. And I thought I would start with the simple one, that's the closest to how one surfaces are made in Rhino. This was a render for a baby toy. It's called a bead manipulative. The idea is that these beads slide around on these rails and the baby slides the beads back and forth and then the baby is happy. We don't yet know yet whether the babies of America are going to go for this. We have had this object manufactured. This is a piece of cheap injection molded junk from China that we hope to sell at Walmart and Target. And I'm so proud that we made it from here to there. It's going to be called the Beedo, hopefully coming soon to find retailers near you. And let's look at how it was modeled. Here it is in Rhinoceros. Now, Matt, you'll let me know if I start going too fast and messing up the frame rate, right? Yep. Yeah, looking good okay. so far. So here we are. Here we are in Rhinoceros looking at this object as it was modeled. Now, the only T-spliny part of this is this object here, these things which we call the hubs. The rails and the beads are straight up Rhino modeling. And you can see that there's all this subtle organic stuff going on in here. Now, how did I make that in T-splines? Well, it actually wasn't very complicated. Let me just pull back into the shaded viewport so we can get a look at this. These green lines are the skeleton of this object. Now I will turn off the object itself and you can see how this was made. Now I'm accustomed to modeling in Rhinoceros using the network surf command in which one simply draws curves at the boundaries and lofting through the middle of one's surface. And in this case I worked almost the same way in T-splines. The T-spline that I have made will actually be right on top of these curves. So what I did, of course, when I was originally modeling the curves, I made only one leg since the object is symmetrical, then rotated around to make these curves which define the contours of the surface, and then I used a T-splines command which actually draws the surface which will be defined by these curves in a very similar way to how network surf works in Rhino. The first thing I do is check that all the curves intersect properly because if the curves miss each other then they don't define a surface well. And we can see by displaying these intersections that it does work. So that's all very well. And then the next thing that happens is I try to get T-splines to draw the surface. And T-splines makes, makes a guess about how the surfaces interact with these curves. And of course it doesn't guess right in every case because as usual what I'm trying to do is perverse. So I'm going around and popping out all the surfaces that aren't really there. And that causes T-splines to revise its guesses, getting smarter and smarter, until it's actually homing in on the object that I'm building. And you can see T-splines is building this lovely surface that follows my curves perfectly. And it would have taken a thousand years to get Rhino to build by using network surf commands. And we're almost done getting this thing to have the right topology. T-splines really wants to fill in those small surfaces, which is quite reasonable. It's, I, I assume it's looking for the smallest surfaces that will cover this network of curves. And there we are. That's what that object will look like. And then there's a number of other things I can check. One thing I want to do is T-splines will try to use the fewest control points possible on the surface, and I want to persuade it to use a few more control points. At least that's what I think I'm doing, my understanding of the technical 
aspects of what's going on here may be poor, but what these what adding these spans will do is cause T splines to hug the surface a little bit more closely. That's exactly right, yep. I could crank it up a lot more. Two spans is enough for this demo. Yep. Just to make a note, this is the, the T spine skin command, the TS skin command. Yes, this is the TS skin command, which is a command that I think is not terribly popular, but if you're a control freak and you really want your surface to just follow those curves, you don't want to be impressionistic about this at all. You simply want to map out where the surface is going to be and then lay it on there. This is a nice way to work. So this was, for me, a good transition from working directly in Rhino to working with T-splines because it's the, it's the closest analog to what happens when you, you make your curve skeleton and then put a whole lot of network surfs on it. So here I am drawing my beautiful T-spline, and there it is. Now, one thing I wish is that there was a little bit more creasy up here, so I'm going to use the ts crease command to add some little sharp edges in here. And let's see if that works. Yes. So now this is very nice. If I put it into render mode, I can see my object. And it's smooth everywhere, except that it's got these creases that I just put in, and this is very nice. And you can see how simple this is. All I have is this skeleton consisting of a dozen or so curves. Now, of course, having done that, I'm naturally going to wish to fool with the T-spline, because nothing is ever perfect the first time. And if I turn on the vertices of this T-spline, I can now kind of treat them as virtual clay and actually just drag them around. I'm just going to pick a vertex here. And suppose I feel that this dent is a little bit too deep. I feel like the creases go a little bit too far into the object. I can just yank it up. And it responds in real time. I'm, I'm modeling digital clay here, which is kind of a, a astonishing way to work. You can sort of simulate this in Naked Rhino using just the history command with network surf, but it's, I find it a lot more difficult to work with. This is, for me, a nice sort of digital clay workflow. If I want to, I can say I feel like that groove should be more of a ridge. I can just yank that up. It's digital comment. clay. Um, but, yep. On uh, so you see, you usually use the Rhino Network Surf command. Why? Why would? Uh, why, why wouldn't you just use that for this shape? Um, because there would be a bajillion of them. I'd have to use Network Surf a lot of times to get this to come around and do what it does. And it just doesn't give you as good a surface. It won't give you the nice rounded end on the paw. Besides, I wouldn't have this beautiful ability to, to maul it around afterwards. It would take forever. I've done a lot of these. It does take forever. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyway, here I am, back with my happy T-spline. And having gotten that, I needed to add, the only thing I need to do after making this T-spline, you can see that once the T-spline is made, and once these very simple surfaces here, these rail surfaces and these bead surfaces. These, bead, these beads are the simplest thing in the world. They're just a single surface. So those two things, the rails and the beads, I modeled in Rhino. And then the last thing I had to do was get little sockets in there. So that the rails could actually fit into the hubs. And for that, I just pop the T-splines back out into Rhino using the, the TS convert command to make them into normal Rhino poly surfaces. And I, I just finished the job in Rhinoceros. So we have this nice portability thing where having got this beautiful organically modeled T-spline, I was able to just pop it back into Rhino and resume using my normal tool set to finish the job. So that was that. And that really ended up being quite a simple modeling project. So now let's look at a more difficult That's Shiba. Before, before you move on, if I could just make one comment about how you converted that to, to a Rhino object to do the, um, to trim out the, the circle for the, the connectors. Um, sometimes we have people that try to stay in T-spines for, for everything they ever do, 
Um, but that's um, that that really is limiting yourself if you just only stick in T-spine. That's I think that's a great way how you did that to switch back to Rhino to use their nice trimming tools to get that done. Modeling is all about what we call in the 3D printing courses for courses. You have to have a big toolbox. No tool does everything. People always write in and ask me, oh, what software should I learn so that I can be you? And I'm like, well, you know, I didn't do this with one piece of software. The way you do this is by letting lots of different tools interact. That's how exciting things happen. Okay, now if we're through with this model, I'm going to quit out of it, just so I'll have one less window. And let's look at another model, which coincidentally offers a much more hybrid way of working. This model was made the organic part of it in T-splines, and then this mesh part of it was done in a completely different way. It's a nice example of how T-splines can be friendly and interact with other things. This model, by the way, can be obtained at Shapeways. It's not on my site in metal. Shapeways is a wonderful place to get metal models and various other kinds of things. I designed this model to be printed in, don't tell anyone, I'm about to leak something, glass. We can 3D print glass now. It's not transparent, it's going to look like porcelain, but it is incredibly cool. So that's what I designed this model for, and hopefully by the end of this week you will be able to order your own glass parts at Shapeways, so look forward to that. So on to how this thing was modeled. It looks like this. It comes in two pieces. Now, this piece I basically modeled by magic. That is to say, I used a whole lot of techniques that would make an entire webinar by themselves. So I'm not going to go into how I made that. But the T-spliny part of it, I can talk about. So my original idea for this piece... Let's see, let's I, I think the frame rate's uh -huh. a little bit slower on this, just so you know. So. Oh, okay. So right now we're seeing the smooth... I'll try to, we're seeing the smooth... We're seeing uh, a smooth surface. Yep. I think we've caught up with you now. But. Okay. I'll try to go a little slower. Oh, and to answer that question, X1 is printing in glass. So, this was my original inspiration for this piece. It's a very simple object made out of two rhino surfaces. And then I thought to myself, well, hell, where am I going to go with that? And I started sketching out, let me get back into shaded mode so you can see curves again. I started out thinking, okay, I'm going to start sketching this thing. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm going to use TS Skin, and I'm going to work the same way I worked on the last project. But, you know, that did not work out very well. So I used a different workflow, and I sort of built a cage around the object that I wanted to draw. That is to say, a big polyhedral cage around this object, and then I used, I'm not going to do this live because it might get weird, I used the TS from lines command to make a T-spline that you can see is completely inside that cage, using this cage as the control polygons to draw that T-spline. So this is, again, a little bit less control freaky in that the T-spline sort of hangs out inside the cage. It's just as deformable, which is wonderful. But the main thing is that it's, it's a different way of coming at it. This is something that is much harder to do in Naked Rhino. And I did it again because using TS Skin just wasn't suiting the topology of this piece. So the next thing I did with this was activate the T-spline symmetry command in order to make my object symmetrical. T-spline supports bilateral symmetry and to some extent radial symmetry, which if you only ever make completely symmetrical objects like me, is very handy. Now, let's see if that comes up. There we are. So now I have a nice bilaterally symmetrical T-spline. It has a giant crease in it, though, which I think I'm going to get rid of, which I do by the ETS remove creases command. And I could sit around picking the points that are actually creased, but since I don't want any creases in this object, I might as well just pick all the points. So I just dragged a big selection box over every point in that model, and now I have a nice smooth model with no creases. Well, of course, it doesn't look very much like my original inspiration for this, but you can see it's beginning to elaborate on it. So now I can turn off my control polygons. And the next thing that happens is that I can start to, again, mess with this object. I can turn on the TS manipulators, and... I can work with this object by dragging around its edges, by fooling with its faces. One of the first things I want to do is start to extend these horns. So I 
popped off the ends of them. And now I have a little hole here into my object. I can go to vertex mode and start extending this out. Ooh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to extrude these vertices. The edges there. Hey, okay, where are you doing this? Yes, edges? You, Is that yeah, what go I want? To, go okay. to edge mode, yep. Then just select right. them. Okay, now I've selected these edges. Okay, thanks. This is why my workflow takes so long, I can't remember anything ever. <laughs> but now you can see my surface has required, has, my object has acquired a new little set of surfaces there. Now I can pull into vertex mode. I spent almost all of my time in T-splines fooling with the vertices. I can actually just take these vertices and yank them out, extending this horn. And you can see because of the symmetry, the other one goes with me. I can sit here and model freely on this thing. One thing that I like to do is use the uh, UVN mode with these manipulators so that things can always be moved normal to the surface. This makes me very happy. And now I can sit there and say, well, this is too flat. I'm going to make it bulgier. If I feel like there's not enough edges to do what I want, I can add more. Say I want to put in some more detail here. I can just... pop in additional T-splines edges, and now I have more vertices to work with. And I can spend all day just yanking this thing around and making it look more and more different. I can change the topology. And again, I'm, I'm working with this as digital clay. I'm pushing it, I'm pulling it, I can do whatever I want. So after I'd done that for a while, I get a model that looks like this. Ooh, it's inside out. Let's see. If I'm lucky, maybe I can make it turn right side out. Um, yeah, maybe I'm just try to use the TS yeah, flip the command yeah, and see if yeah. that does the job. There we go. Now it's the right way out. That was just some kind of weird meshing artifact. So you can see it's matured quite a bit since it looked like this. and I've done a good deal of modeling. It's not quite done, but we're getting there. Now at this point in this model, I did sort of a funny thing. I used TS Extract P Control Polygon, and I actually went back to working with it as a cage. I pulled out the curves that surround this thing and worked back into that cage, and then used again TS From Lines to go back into it. And this was totally a perverse thing to do. As I say, my workflow is long and meandering. But the point is that I could do it. The t splends offers this ability to go back and forth between the cage and the object. And when it was done, it came out looking like this. You can see that it's acquired these holes as a result of these green lines in the cage. So I got from here to there purely as T-spline modeling, and you can see the object has acquired a great deal of subtlety between one of these and the other. So having done that, I popped into existence my beautiful hedgehog mesh here, and then popped this out of T-splines, applied a simple Boolean union to fuse it all together, and declared victory. So there's an example of, a, of an object with a slightly lengthier T-splines workflow, and that wound up being completely hybridized with this other object that has nothing to do with T-splines at all. I'm very happy with this thing. My fans all hate it because it's not mathematical enough, but I personally enjoyed this a great deal. This was a very liberating model for me. So lastly, I would like to look at a model that I did completely in T-splines that's not hybrid at all, and that was just fiendishly difficult and took forever. But I don't think that was the fault of T-splines. It's just the fault of that I don't know what it's going to look like until it's finished. So let's take a look at that. Here we are back in slideshow land. Don't forget, glass printing is here. You are about the first few hundred people on Earth to know this. It is so exciting. So this is a model which I call Control-Alt-Welk. It's my fake seashell. 
and here it is printed in metal. We got this beautiful copper plated effect on the metal print. This happens randomly, like once in 50 models we get one that get, that's this color and nobody seems to know why. So here's the CAD model for this. Now how did I get to this object? I got there directly but very, very slowly. So let me just go back to my original sketch. This was how I started with this. And this was a sketch that was actually done in normal Rhino. These are all network surf objects. I simply built a curved skeleton, which apparently I've deleted since then, and just lofted and, and uh, network surfed and just hand built all these surfaces. So this was my sketch of what I thought it might look like if everything was going well. And working from that sketch, I made a set of curved skeletons. So this was my sketch for this object. And I actually used TS skin. Now we're back in control freak mode of making the T-spline surfaces actually hew very, very closely to the curved skeleton. And here it is at one stage of being modeled. And you can see I've already modeled it significantly from the original skeleton at this point. But once I, once I got the skeleton and then I made the T-spline, then I just stayed in the T-spline and modeled and modeled and modeled this thing by yanking those points around. The topology didn't change much at all. I didn't feel very much need to add and remove surfaces. I just yanked those points around and worked the clay until it looked like the thing that I wanted. It's a maddening way to work, but unfortunately it's the way I work, and I just have to sit through it until the sculpture comes out the other end. One funny thing about this piece is that it has the topology of a Mobius strip. So this meant that I couldn't model it using only one T-spline, because like almost every other type of CAD program, T-splines gets confused when you have a surface that has a half twist in it so that it only has one side. This means that the, the normals of it can't be resolved properly because they point in two different directions at the same time. So because of that, I had to work with this object in two pieces. Now you'll notice that this thing is a surface. It has naked edges. It does not contain any volume. It's just a single surface. And that's why the Mobius strippiness of it is a problem. So having modeled on this thing for quite a while, the next thing to do after that, I'm not going to do this in real time because it would take forever because this is a heavy model. but the next stage in this, after mulling that T-spline indefinitely, was to add thickness, which I did using the ts thicken command. And you can see there's a little rim of edge, edge surfaces that have been added around this thing. And now it actually has three-dimensional existence. It has thickness. So now it's a buildable object. We've gone from a surface with naked edges, which was a Mobius strip and couldn't physically exist, to something that has thickness, that has volume, is 3D printable. And I use the ts crease command to make this edge here sharp, while this little other edge here is nicely bullnosed, and these edges are completely blunted off. And also something you can't see is that this channel which extends inwards here stops after a certain point up here. This becomes solid, again, so as to make it 3D printable. And all that I modeled in T-splines by adding and removing surfaces vertices, edges, and just plain yanking those points around. Oh, it's a pain being a sculptor. So I made this object, and it was very nice, but the next thing that happened was that I found out that you can't 3D print it. It turned out to be impossible to get the support material out of those long, helical, curving channels. So I thought, hell, I'm going to drill some holes in this and make it printable. And to do that, again, I dropped back into Rhino. I turned this thing into a poly surface, and put some rhino curves on it, and just drilled some holes. Unfortunately, something I did before drilling those holes, which I was sorry about in retrospect, I took this model and I pulled it out into ZBrush as a mesh, and I added this subtle surface texture on it so that it's got this nice orange peel effect on the outside, and then it becomes smooth in the interior. And you can imagine how that nice that looked. I got a single awesome 3D print of this. And then I found out that it was basically impossible to 3D print this object. So I had to add the holes. And I couldn't be bothered to put the texture back after the holes. So we lost that little detail. But, you know, that's the fortunes of war.
So anyway, this was the model that I wound up with. And again, I'm very satisfied with it. It is going to look so gorgeous in glass. That's what I made it for, so as to see the light bouncing around in there and coming through, as it would in a real seashell, only, I hope, better. So that's pretty much my presentation. That was three different ways in T-splines, working by TS skin to make a simple object that's very close to its, its defining curves, working by TS from lines to make an object that's defined by a cage and that allows you to go back and forth between the cage and the object, and then simply working straight up in T-splines, making a T-spline and then doing all of the topological and the surface modeling by just yanking those points and edges and surfaces around in T-splines itself as a modeling environment. And those are all valid ways to work. It all depends on what you're doing and how it ends up going. The point is that it offers variety. So there we are back to the beginning. Some works by me, how I made them. And we will now, I think, be taking questions. Do we have any questions? Uh, the questions are coming in, Bas. You did a great job. Thank you very much. Um, before we uh, before we take those questions, though, let me just um, announce how we are going to uh, give away a copy or a free Bathsheba mini sculpture. Um, Did you decide which one one it's going to be? Um, well, we're or going to actually we're going to let them pick. So Bathsheba, can you, see, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. Okay, yeah, so to thank everyone for sticking around, um, we're having a drawing to win a free mini sculpture from Bathsheba.com. So if you go over there, you can see there's a lot. These are just some of the really cool designs you can get. Um, so there's two ways that we're going to give one away. Um, the first way is we're going to try out something with GoToWebinar. We're going we're gonna to do a little survey right now, and um, let me see if I can pull this up. And if you're still around... Um, then go ahead and answer this poll if you would like to be eligible to win um, one of these sculptures. And uh, what we're going to do is just take all of the people that answered yes, uh, which basically shows that you're still here, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow that has a link to the webinar, and we'll also announce uh, the, the randomly chosen winner. Um, we thought about throwing dartboards at our screen, but that just didn't seem right. So um, we'll uh, let's just I'll just leave this up for a couple more seconds to go ahead and vote there. And um, Kate, three, two, one, go ahead and close that poll. And um, let's see, let's go ahead and pull this up again. So that's the first way that you can. Uh, win one of these sculptures, so we'll go ahead and send that out in the email. The second way you can win is in that email we'll have a link to a recording of this webinar, and if you go ahead and, and blog about the webinar, tweet it, or otherwise post a link to the webinar, then we'll be scouring uh, the web with uh, our Google Alerts and other things, and um, we will choose uh, one more winner to receive a free Bathsheba mini sculpture within 48 hours, or after 48 hours after we send out that email. So. Um, so that being said, um, now we have some time for questions. And um, let's see where we want to start with these. Um, let's see, you can see those as well, I believe, Bathsheba. But let's see, one of the, one of the people we're asking a lot is, uh, is you, if you can just uh, comment on the glass printing one more time. Um, who's mm -hmm. the company that's doing that? Um, that would be, again, X1 Pro Metal. And how do you spell that? I am just going to my slide that says this information. X1 rolled out metal printing, what, five or six years ago, five years ago, and they found out that you can actually use the same machines to print glass. You just roll, load them up with glass powder instead of steel powder and do pretty much the same process. Modulo, you have to do a little vitreous glaze thing at the end to get that to work. This process will eventually offer color. They'll be able to do black, white, clear, and hopefully other colors. Okay, great. It has mostly the same limitations as metal printing, and it is going to be so great, and it will soon be available on Shapeways. Woo. Okay, so here's the question. Is there a trick to output T-splines in a ZBrush-friendly way? I am frustrated by the standard Rhino export. Um, well, what you have to do is get a mesh out of your object. The way I have worked with ZBrush is by exporting from Rhino using... Let's see, what format is it one uses? Damn it, I'm forgetting. They only have one mesh file format in common. 
OBJ? It's slipping my mind what one it is. It might be OBJ. But it's simply a matter of exporting the mesh from Rhino and then importing it into ZBrush. And the difficulty here tends to be that Rhino's native mesher, the thing that it, that, to, that it uses to convert polysurfaces, just doesn't work all that great. So what I tend to do is mesh rather coarsely in Rhino and then do some refining in ZBrush because ZBrush has a much better mesh refiner than Rhino's mesh generator. Cool. Um, one other thing I'll decide is you can also, there's a TS mesh command that will, if you're, if you're only meshing a T-spun, you don't, if you haven't trimmed your model yet, then that will give you an optimized mesh. Really? Well. That's news to me. i got to take a look at that. Yeah, there you does go. Does T-splines actually have its own mesher? Um, it does, yep. Wow, I'll have to take a look, because Rhino is, is, is uh, certainly that's a weak point in that piece of software. It's just the, the TS mesh command, so. Um, well, I'll have to try that. Yeah. I learn something every day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, I told them when they asked me to do this webinar, you know, I don't really know how any of this works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Am I a good person to present about this? I don't think I can actually use this piece of software. No, so you can see I'm learning all the time. That's great. Um, so uh, another question. Um, let's see. Is the texture in the picture from the 3D printing process? And I can't remember which picture that was from. But Well, this picture that I have up right now, can everyone still see this picture? Yep. This is a good example of the modeling texture because this is an extreme close-up of a very small model and you can see it has these lines on it and those are in fact the lines along which the steel powder was laid down. So those are growth rings left by the 3D printing process. So I'm pretending this texture is my style but actually it's just what comes out of the machine. Cool. Um, let's see another well, question. We, oh, go ahead. I wish we could print perfectly smooth models but we're still waiting for the technology to catch up with that. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a bit more about making holes techniques, uh, about how to make holes in T-splines models, what your techniques are? Um, well, in one of the models that I showed, in the Welk model, I simply made my holes by popping out into Rhino and drilling them there. Now, in this model, I did make the holes in T-splines. And I did it by, let's see, maybe I should open up my Rhino again and get back into this. Basically, the way I did it was by punching out a T-spline's face on one side of where I wanted the hole and then t punching out a T-spline's face on the other side of where I wanted the hole and then sewing those two sets of naked edges together. Okay, because you were doing it between, this was in a solid then. Um, yeah. Yeah, and one one actually new command that is in T-Spline's version 2.2 is what we call the bridge, right? Yeah, the bridge command that yeah, that where you can actually is, take two edge loops and it's, it'll sew them together automatically. Yep, or just even two faces and it'll just join them right together. Yeah, that makes this much better. Yep. Okay, now is this still a T-Spline or did I pop it back out into yep. Rhino? Yeah, that looks like a T-Spline. Yeah, it does. So here you can see how the facets are. My rhino is hanging, but why? Let's see. Well, well, that's darn to find out. Well, that's updating, Basti. But here's another question: mm -hmm. Do you have any use for grasshopper? Is there any way to combine T um, and I am grasshopper? sure that I do, but I have not yet found the time to dive in and learn that piece of software. But grasshopper is on my list. I have no idea how it interacts with T splines or really what it does, but it's certainly something that I want to explore. I do a good deal of algorithmic work. I tend to do most of the programming part outside of Rhinoceros in actually in Perl of all possible things. And I'll use that to generate Rhino commands and import them. And I gather that Grasshopper can really streamline that process. So I look forward to getting at it. Haven't done it yet. Yeah, and I guess just to answer the the Grasshopper with T-Splines integration, um, there is ways to use that. Um, we have T-Splines version 2.3, which is um, out kind of in beta on our forum that anyone can download. And that has some optimizations for Grasshopper in there as well. So um, if anyone has more questions about that, I'll let Tom kind of, you can go ahead and type the questions and I'll let Tom um, type questions back um, silently because he knows a lot more about that. Um, let's see. Yes, how will get nowhere by asking me about Grasshopper. <laughs> um, how did you merge the two separate Mobius strips? Did the edges have to line up? Um, that's a good question, and yes, the edges did have to line up. I didn't merge the Mobius strips as Mobius strip because you can't actually do that. It causes 
you, you can't make a Mobius strip in T-splines and indeed in most other pieces of CAD software. This is not unique to T-splines. They all go psychotic if you hand them a one-sided surface. So what I did was add the thickness. And once it has thickness, it's no longer a Mobius strip. Then it's a closed volume. And then I could simply sew using TS Weld the naked edges together. Great. Um, let's see. Do you make much use of Mathematica in creating meshes? And if so, how did you get them into NURBS? I make very little use of Mathematica. I have it, but I cannot say that I understand it. If I could learn one more computer language, that is the computer language that I would learn. But so far, I've found it to be a tall tree to climb. I use it in computing the, the initial models for some of my more mathematical objects. It does produce meshes. It does not produce NURBS. And there is no sensible way to get back from meshes to NURBS. So I, when I work with meshes exported from Mathematica, I would be working with, working with them completely as meshes. OK. Um, do you consider your work a product of chance operation? Um, in the same sense that I consider my brain a product of chance operation. <laughs> I experience it as intentional, but who is to say that my intentions are rational? There are happy accidents. Anytime you bring something out of your brain and start creating it using a medium, whether that medium be oil paint or clay or CAD CAM or any kind of 3D printing, things that are unexpected will happen. And whenever something unexpected does happen, you can crush it and try to make the thing that you expected happen, or you can run with it. And all sorts of accidents occur in a workflow as, as long and meandering as mine, I think everything can safely be attributed to chance. Hmm. Um, here, here's a great question. What would you say is the most relevant difference between working with T-splines and working with a mesh modeler, like ZBrush or something like that? Well, I'm not an intensive mesh modeler, so I might be a funny person to ask that question of. What I like about T-splines as a modeler is that it preserves the tightness of the curves. It preserves the fact that you have busier curves here. And they are made by taking control points and making a beautiful, smooth, piano wire-like curve. And when I push those points around in T-splines, that, that tightness and smoothness of those curves is preserved. Whereas when you start working with something in a mesh model, or things get wiggly in a hurry. The surface gets disturbed, bumps and dents develop, and it's very hard to smooth them out again. Just as if you're sanding a piece of wood, once it develops an irregularity, that irregularity tends to get larger. It's very hard to sand out a bump because the sandpaper keeps catching on the bump and making it bigger. And that's what tends to happen to be in metal mesh modelers. Things get just more lumpy and clayey, and I want them to be tight and smooth. So T-splines allows one sort of to preserve the nerves nature of the surface while working with it as clay, which is kind of what I've always wanted. That's a, that's a good answer. Um, OK, here's a question that's come up um, qu a number of times. Are you trained in both math and sculpture? Yes, I went to Yale and got a bachelor's in mathematics. And then I went to UPenn and got an MFA in sculpture. And I have studied all of those traditional metalworking arts. I can weld. I can fabricate. I can uh, do a sand casting. I can pour bronze. Naturally, I never have occasion to do these things anymore. But that is how I was trained. And one thing I would I not say. Oh, go ahead. I certainly wouldn't say that I'm a mathematician. I mean, an undergraduate degree in mathematics brings you up to the state of the art about 200 years ago. So I would say that I have a, a, a grounding in mathematics, and that would be all. Just enough to follow along with the, when the uh, clever people get to talking. And and one thing I just I would just add um, Bathsheba's website Bathsheba.com she lists quite a bit of her background, which I found very interesting to read. Um, so I think she lists more more about that there. I had a lot of day jobs. For many years, I worked as a uh, research assistant to various kinds of scientists. And I came into contact with a lot of interesting ideas there. I still have a protein structure modeling business hmm. that in some ways came out of all that. I worked at Fermilab one summer. I just knocked around for a long time. My problem was that I went to art school. And then it was fully 10 years before the technology matured to the point where I could actually become a working artist, because my medium didn't yet exist. So it was a long period when I just really had nothing to do except develop my portfolio and work my day job. So here's a couple of questions about the, the top, I guess, armadillo piece. Um, mm -hmm. Whether um, that was done in Rhino or T-splines or done in a different software, 
um, like how that how that was built. All of it that was done outside of T's plants was done in Rhino. Just using but the Rhino it, mesh, or um, no, using well, using mesh and Sporf. Sporf is one of my favorite Rhino commands. That's how this 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 latticey object mapped onto this curved surface by using Sporf. And to thicken and smooth the mesh, I did use some tools outside of Rhino, some of which I wrote myself, so it's a little hard to explain what they do in a quick and easy way. Like I say, I could give a whole other webinar on how I created that mesh. It Here, wasn't quite magic, but it's not that easy to explain in a hurry. Yeah. Um, another question, and I'm, again, I'm not sure which piece this is referring to, but how does this metal hold up to sandblasting? Maybe one of the last metal pieces you were showing. Oh, very well. It reacts to sandblasting and to pretty much every other process more or less the same way as steel does. It's solid metal. So you can sit and it does what any piece of metal does when you sandblast it, which is to say it gets clean. Okay. Um, let's see, Bathsheba, how do you solve the problem about rectangular textures like alligator skin over your models? Did you ever try to set any texture like that? Um, I very rarely use textures because unless you're using a displacement mapping, they're not going to come out in 3D printing, and I'm not that interested in making renders. So the problem of texture mapping these objects is basically completely unsolved. I have no idea how to do it. In particular, if you have an object like this, which has extremely complex topology, I can't even imagine how you would begin to texture map that. When we can 3D print color, then I'm going to have a serious problem because I'm going to actually need to solve this problem of how to wrap color onto an object like this. And certainly it can be done and people do it. I don't know how. It's a real problem. Yeah. Topology and texture mapping don't mix that well. Um, another question. On a manufacturing side, do you concern yourself with overlapping triangles? Do you use magics? Absolutely. I concern myself obsessively with overlapping triangles, and I use magics a great deal. I find it to be an extremely useful tool. It is unfortunately very expensive. I mean, the reason I have it is that I designed these lamps which were made and which are manufactured under license to materialize. And one of the things they kicked back to me is a copy of the software. I wouldn't have it otherwise. But if you can get hold of it, it is the bomb. If you can't get hold of it, Mesh Lab is a good tool for getting rid of mesh imperfections. But yes, if you want to 3D print, you do. You, overlapping triangles are going to be a big, big part of your life because you must destroy all of them before you can send your object to be printed. Here's another, here's another question, and maybe I'll go ahead and answer this. Um, the question is, have you ever tried uh, low-density mesh to NURBS with T-splines? Um, that's actually workful that a lot of our users will do, is to take a low-density mesh um, like an OBJ from... Uh, light, light wave or moto or even even from ZBrush and convert that over to T-splines and NURBS. I don't, have you ever done that yourself, Bathsheba? I've never done that. Mesh to NURBS is a direction that I don't really go because I don't... If, you, if I came from a mesh modeling background and was comfortable working that way, most of the stuff that I sketch out could be sketched perfectly well as meshes, but because I, I started with NURBS, that's what I tend to do. Yeah. So it's purely a personal idiosyncrasy, but I don't tend to swing that way. Yeah, yeah, and the and the trick with that is to have definitely quad dominant meshes, and we actually did a webinar like that a few yeah. months ago. You can find it on our website. Yeah, Rhinoceros is not that into quad meshes, as far as I know. Let's see. Okay, there's a lot more questions. I'm trying to figure out which ones to ask you. Um, Triage them. Is there a link that you recommend to get to know and understand mathematical surfaces? Um. The short answer to that is no. Mathematical surfaces is, is an extremely broad category because every surface is mathematical. I mean, there are surfaces that have been parametrized, and then there are surfaces that haven't yet been parametrized. And I can't really point it anywhere in particular that, that's going to start elucidating that area. You have to narrow it down to a particular thing that you're interested in, and then do what I do, which is start Googling until you know more than you knew before. As I recall, though, you do have some useful links on your website that, that point to at least topics similar to this. I do, but sadly out of date. One link that I'm very fond of is a, is a site called Surface Evolver, which is designed for exploring minimal surfaces, which are some of the loveliest surfaces around. I don't know if everyone's still looking at my screen, but this glass object that I have up is an example of a, a slightly transformed minimal surface. 
And this is one of the areas where you can get tremendously beautiful objects for a really trifling investment in understanding the math. So that, that's one place to start if you're interested in surfaces that look like this with Surface Evolver. Okay, Surface Evolver. Um, and then another question, did you say that SPORF is what you used in Rhino for the armadillo? It's one of the things I used. Okay, that was, that was the word though. Yes, um, SPORF. Okay, so another he, name, but I'm forgetting it. I think it's like flow along surf or something like that. Okay, yeah, and it's not coming to my mind as well. But um, here's a good question: What's the approximate time that it took you to do um, some of these models in Rhino, and then the time with T splines? I, I I know that's hard because every model's different. It's a, it's a strange question because I've never modeled the same thing in Rhino as I have modeled in T splines. Um. Hmm. I would say it takes the same amount of time, but you get different objects. I mean, it takes me as long as it takes to make a sculpture. Nothing saves me time, because if I have more time, I'm going to use it to make the object better or different or more like what I intended, or I'm just going to spend more time exploring it. I'm comfortable spending one to three months working on a sculpture. Wow. And if I have better tools, that's not really going to speed up. It's just going to mean that I make a more involved object. Is it that takes one... me that long to be sure that something is perfect. And is, is that how long do you spend inside the CAD program, or do you spend time outside of the CAD program first? Um, that would be the time spent in CAD. Time spent outside CAD isn't work. That is to say, if I spend time sketching or doing research or whatever, but I don't really spend much time doing that. I mostly just jump straight into CAD and do my exploring there. Uh -huh. This is my job, sitting in front of this machine and tweaking those points until it looks like sculpture. That's what I spend the bulk of my design hours doing. Wow. It's so, a drag, I tell you. I miss the studio time. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how do you get a, fin a polished finish on the metal? Well, I run it through, first I patina it in order to turn it black, and then I run it through a thing like a rock tumbler, which I can go back and show you the picture of it. There it is. So this is simply a rotating drum, which sits on these two rotating bars which drive it and I put my piece inside this object with some water and some abrasives and I just let it go round and round and round for about 10 hours and after that it comes out all nice and smoothed out. <coughs> However, it's notable that since X1 is now doing tumble finishing in-house, if I want a piece smoothed now, I can simply call up X1 and say, hey, you know that model I ordered? Please tumble it for me. And then it gets smooth without my having to do anything. So there's two ways to do it. If you have a tumbler, you can do it yourself. If not, you can just order your model finished. Oh, kids today, they have it so easy. <laughs> um, let's see. I, it's probably a question that's hard to answer briefly, but how did you model the lamps that um, were shown earlier? Um, well, it wasn't very difficult, actually. It's the dirty little, dirty little secret of this is it's not, it's not that hard to make models like this. It's what's hard is having the ideas. So let's see, I'm just going to flip back to that lamp. So this lamp is made out of a surface, which is pieced together out of a lot of small surfaces. This is all pre-T-splines, so this surface was simply modeled by hand. And then I ran it through a little algorithmic dingus that I wrote in order to punch all those little holes. So this is a lamp that was not difficult at all to model. And indeed, it's been reverse engineered by several people, which shows you just how easy it is. People who looked at a picture like this and said, hey, I can model that, and they did. There's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> hmm. um, let's see. I, if, do we have maybe, maybe five more minutes, Bathsheba? Are you, how are yeah, you on? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, if the people are hanging on, on, I'm happy to answer questions. Keep, keep on coming in. Um, what's the final 3D printing output file? Is it an STL? Yes, that would be an STL file. That's um, the industry standard. And then a question, when you talk about magics, are you talking about geomagics? Um, no, I'm talking about magics, which is a piece of software made by Materialize. And, heck, what's the name of it? I don't think it has any name other than magics. Okay, but not I agree, it's, it's, with raindrops. It's, un it's, it, it's an unfortunate ambiguity. Yep. Um, let's see, other questions. Have you tried to go for a larger scale like your earlier works as 3D printing is very limited in size? Um, well, actually, the larger piece that I showed was not an earlier work. That was just a couple of years ago. 
and uh, I have used 3D printing to make big objects. You have to come at it a little bit differently. You use different 3D printing processes. You work by assembling modules rather than by rather than by 3D printing directly or casting directly, but it can certainly be done. Okay. Um, let's see, here's a clarification from Paul Cowell. SPORF is now called Flow Long Surf. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, but you can still type SPORF and it will work. There you go. Um, let's see, what is the scale for the models you are outputting? Are there any limitations? Um, the main limitation is how much money you have you're going to run out of money long before, before the 3D printer runs out of size. So the smallest objects I can print are about an inch in size. Below that, you're getting into the resolution. And the biggest objects that I make routinely are about 5 inches in size. You can, in principle, go up to 10 inches by 20 inches by 40 inches, but you would need a very big pile of cash hmm. to do that because you're paying basically by the cubic centimeter. Hmm. So as the object gets big, the uh, price goes up as the cube of dimension. So an object which is twice as big costs eight times as much. Oh, it's good to keep in mind. Yeah, people always ask me this question, but then when they hear the quote, they fall on the floor. <laughs> um, let's see, here's a good question. Did the baby toy have to be imported into a separate program before it was manufactured? Were there any difficulties with the, with the T-splines? Um, I exported it as NURBS and as mesh, <clears throat> and which what the factory actually did with it, I am not sure. I believe they pulled it into Pro-E and worked with it there as NURBS prior to getting it into the actual injection molding process. <clears throat> Once it goes to China, a lot of things happen to it that I don't know that much about. Yeah, we, we get that question a lot. T-spline surfaces, when they're exported, um, they'll export just like a rhino poly surface. Um, but since T-splines are watertight, um, usually those exports, um, I mean, they're, they're very clean exports. You'll get a nice, nice clean surface instead of other programs. Yeah, T-splines makes, makes pretty nice poly surfaces. Again, since I'm 3D printing, usually what I'm doing is going straight to the mesh. But in this particular case, I think they did work with the NURBS. Okay, um, someone's asking about a mirror finish, Bathsheba. Um, there's enough texture on these parts that a mirror finish is not a reasonable expectation unless you're willing to lose a lot of material. If you look at how much texture this object has on it, if you polish that down, you would lose nearly a millimeter of the object. And at that point, there goes your dimensional accuracy, and why are you even bothering to 3D print at all? So if you're willing to polish like a mad bastard, you can get a mirror finish. But at that point, I feel like you're, you're losing enough that you might as well manufacture this thing in a way that's more friendly to getting that kind of surface in the first place. So you can do it, but I don't think I'm going to. Okay. Um, let's see. It looks like the questions are winding down. I'm, just saying I, I'm sure I probably missed them. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and um, send out a list of these um, questions, at least with the answers that we have typed here, um, along with that follow-up email. So. Okay, and of course, if you have questions, you know, feel free to come to my website and write in, and I'll answer what I can. Sometimes it takes a long time as I get a lot of mail, but if you have a sincere question, I'll try to give you a sincere answer, since I want lots of people to be able to do this. The more people that do this, the bigger and better the market gets for everybody. Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to thank Bathsheba one more time. Um, we really appreciate um, being able to do this webinar with her today, and uh, thank you all for coming and um, we'll uh, send an email out tomorrow. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you all. It's been a pleasure.